This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Ledger and the Ledger Nano S. Half peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more. And by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Robin Crane. We're here today with Jimmy Song. Um, Jimmy is a Bitcoin developer. He used to be VP of engineering at Armory. Some of you will remember that wallet. Uh, now he's working at uh, Itbit slash Paxos. Itbit is uh, you know, New York based uh, Bitcoin exchange and Paxos is building kind of distributed ledger technology for uh, financial institutions. But the reason Jimmy is here today is that he's been writing just a series of really wonderful posts about the current situation in Bitcoin, you know, what's going on with uh, soft fork, user activated soft fork, hard fork, Segwit 2x, New York agreement, uh, Bit 148, Bit 141. There's so much going on. It's extremely complex. And I've been thinking a lot about this, you know, what, what's, what's going to happen? What are the different probabilities? Uh, and I haven't found anyone uh, kind of writing it, writing about this in a nicer way than, than Jimmy in his post. So of course, we'll link to many of them in the show notes. And I'm really excited to talk with Jimmy today about, uh, about all of this. So thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. You're way too kind. You're way too kind. That's, that just like, I, that makes me feel so good. Thank you. It's great being on. I, I haven't really been keeping up with a lot of this drama. I mean, like, I I kind of got sick of it a, a while ago, and then and then I found myself preparing for this art for this episode, and and not really knowing what was going on and what were the different proposals, and uh, and I, I watched some some of the videos that you did with other podcasts and read your articles, and it's a lot clearer now thanks to uh, thanks to your uh, elegant way of putting things and explaining things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I'm just honestly most of the time I'm just translating technical jargon to what normal people read. Um, it's amazing how a lot of coders don't re recognize that when they say jargon, most of the people don't actually understand what they're talking about, even other coders. So yeah, that's what I try to do with my articles. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's such an important thing, you know, because you have these like different, these conversations going on in different, uh, in different buckets and there's not much inter kind of, connection between the two so i'm glad that you're you know solving that a little bit so uh, before we're getting into all of this do you want to give us a bit of a background how did you get into bitcoin and blockchain originally and what has your journey been in this uh, space yeah uh, i mean i i think uh, like a lot of people i uh, i started in like 2011 i saw an article on slash dot that said bitcoin had just broken one dollar and i was like how come i've never heard of whatever this is and um I read some stuff about it. I was really excited and I was gonna go buy like a lot of Bitcoins. And then I found out how hard it was. Like you can't just buy it with PayPal. You you have to, at the time you had to use Dwala and deposit to Mt. Gox and then do a bunch of stuff. And I thought it was too complicated. Uh, so I didn't think about it until I heard about it again. And I think July of that year when every, when Bitcoin went up to something like $30. And at that point, I was kicking myself, thinking I, I, I was so stupid not to buy at a dollar. Uh, did all those steps, got money into Mt. Gox, managed to buy some. Um, and, uh, and you know, I didn't really think about it because Bitcoin price didn't do anything until like 2013. At which point it, it went up and uh, I was like, you know what, I'm a developer. I, I really need to do some stuff with this and really understand this technology. So I went and, uh, and I started contributing to a project called Color Coins. Uh, if, I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, yeah, it, it was uh, it, basically trading other assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, back then, I think Vitalik Buterin was part of it and he wrote, he wrote a white paper for it. We told him that wasn't what we agreed on and he, he said, all right, fine, I'm gonna go make my own coin. So that's, um, that's sort of the beginnings of Ethereum right there. Anyway, I, I did color coins for a while. Um, then I got I, I started doing Bitcoin development professionally. First for uh, Monetas, um, that's a company based in Switzerland. They don't they don't really I I I haven't heard from them in a while. 
and then I went to Armory uh, to work on the Bitcoin wallet there. Um, and I, I've since, uh, you know, contributed to BTCD and a bunch of other projects. And I'm now at ItBit slash Paxos. And I'm called the principal blockchain architect. I'm not really sure what that means, but I, I think it's mostly just coding um, with a nicer title. Uh, but that's that's how I got in. And, uh, I, you know, I mean, it's been a fun and interesting journey, to say the least. And outside of your role at uh, ItBit slash Paxos, are you contributing to any open source projects or contributing uh, to, to, to the ecosystem? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I obviously contributed to Armory and I, I still contribute once in a while if I because I, it's my primary wallet. If I see some deficiency, I, I tend to do something. Um, I've also contributed to BTCD, um, which is an alternate client. And uh, more recently, I've started contributing to Bitcoin Core just a little bit. Um, not that many people know that, so hopefully, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, that doesn't make me sound biased or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, there's a bunch of projects that I've contributed to, just sort of done on my own as well, just, just to see what I can do. You can go take a look at my GitHub, Jimmy Song. All right, well, to, to get into our main discussion here a little bit, so the I mean we've we've also done uh, many podcasts before about the whole scalability in Bitcoin and these controversies. It's it's been uh, I'm sure we've done ten, twenty or more episodes on this. So, but but maybe just from your perspective, can you give a bit of a a really broad overview of you know what has happened and and where are we today? Yeah, I mean it, th this has been going on for like three years. Like we're we're entering our fourth year of this debate, right? Um, I, I think, um, I mean, it really started because people were getting concerned that the you know block size limit was getting reached. There were blocks w once in a while that were very close to one megabyte, even back in two thousand and fourteen, uh, and and for a while, uh, you know, it just sort of was a debate for coders on the Bitcoin dev mailing list. Um, you know, somewhat somewhat spilling over into Reddit, and then we know what happened with Thamos and our Bitcoin and all that stuff. Um, you know, there, there was some censorship there. And I mean, for as far as I'm concerned, most of the dialogue has actually moved over to Twitter. So I, I don't think that's that much of a concern. Anyway, um, yeah, so the scaling debate started then. Um, and, and, you know, somebody came up with segregated witness. I think it was some combination of Peter Wola and Luke Dash Jr. and Greg Maxwell that, that figured out that it could be done without actually hard forking. That was presented at Scaling Bitcoin. There was a Hong Kong agreement at that point. Uh, you know, shortly afterwards, uh, that got kind of broken up. Both sides sort of blaming each other for how it broke up. And that, that was originally basically supposed to be uh, SegWit plus two megabyte blocks. Um, I, I mean, I, I've written this in an article, but I, I really think the issue comes down to that of control. Both sides want a lot more control over Bitcoin. Um, you know, the miners want more development control and developers want more uh, compliance from the miners, if you will. And uh, and that's that's sort of led to where we are today, where, you know, there's, you know, BIP 148 and all this other stuff that, that's been going on. I, it's too many bit numbers to name, actually. But yeah, that's... Uh, it's, it's led to a point where there's been a significant um, clashing of wills, if you will. Talk about this. Uh, I'm interested in this notion of control. But maybe, maybe go in a bit more detail as to what you mean by miners would like more development control and developers would like more control over miners. It seems like a circular kind of argument to me. <laughs> yeah, I, both sides want more control. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, the miners have been asking for two megabyte blocks for a while. And they wanted to get somebody, uh, you know, have a hard fork to two megabyte blocks or even larger. And uh, the developers have more or less um, sort of tabled a lot of the BIPs that were along those lines. I think they're all in, the, they all start with like one zero something. It's like 101, 102, 103, 104, something like that. Um, and for the most part, uh, hard forks are no longer really being considered. And, uh, and for the miners, that was very frustrating uh, because th they want something, they think it, it, it would be perfectly safe and the developers are not giving it to them. Uh, from the miners' perspective, they've been asking for SegWit, and uh, and the miners are not really signaling. From their perspective, it's just sort of 
that that signaling bit is I am ready to I, I've upgraded my software and am ready to uh, allow SegWit transactions. Um, but the miners are sort of using it like a veto um, and they don't like that. So, uh, you know, I, you, you could sort of see uh, how that plays out because miners are trying to replace the or at least were trying to replace the development team with Bitcoin Unlimited. And the developers were sort of trying to replace the miners by, you know, changing things to BIP 8 and, you know, at BIP 148, obviously, and um, trying or even threatening like a proof of work change so that, you know, all the mining equipment would essentially be like big bricks. Um, uh, yeah, hey, it, they both want more control over what the other does, uh, and developers develop, miners sort of mine and secure the network, um, and yeah, that that's been sort of the big fight over the last few years, I think. I mean, the the miners ultimately, to me, have a lot of the of the actual control because they're they're running the network uh, or securing the network. What what is to stop the miners from? writing their i mean if, if the miners want a certain thing why don't they just write it and run that code they they actually uh, apparently have right like a lot of them are at least claiming to be running bitcoin unlimited i don't i don't know if they actually are um it's easy enough to signal and make it look like you are on the network without actually running it but they claim to be uh so it's entirely possible that they are uh the problem becomes when uh, you know, network nodes don't agree. Um, I mean, everyone is sort of master of their own node and you could do whatever you want to your own node uh, and, you know, uh, have any kind of ridiculous rule that, that you want. Uh, but, you know, as soon as you disagree with someone, you're going to fork off to your own chain. So that's really the big risk is that Bitcoin would split into two or even more. Um, and that's why not everybody just sort of runs their own client. They, they want something that's at least compatible with what everyone else is running. Uh, and, you know, the, the miners could uh, do that and they've threatened to uh, just as much as sort of the user activated software people have. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not really that useful unless there's enough of the entire ecosystem coming with you to, to have a viable fork. Yeah, no, that that makes sense to me. It's just that it, it it seems like if there's a minority at some somewhere uh, threatening miners, um, that if 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 their clients are not going to be compatible with the majority of miners that are signaling for one or one or another type of upgrade, um, they're not going to get their transactions validated because the majority of miners are not going to be agreeing with them. I mean, they're, they're not going to be agreeing with the miners that they essentially have the power. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's where maybe, maybe I'm missing something, but I feel like miners could easily sort of take over this power struggle. Um, they could in the sense that they'll have the mining power to sort of have a more robust and secure chain in terms of proof of work. Um, but it's easy enough to fork off, and this is actually, we could talk about this more when we get to BIP 148, but this is essentially what user activated software is doing is sort of um, say, we're, we don't agree with what these miners are doing and you, know, you're, you can't control us, so we're going to do our own thing and whichever miners wanna come with us can. Um, and, you know, you, as long as you get enough of the ecosystem to come with you, it's entirely uh, possible that you can do that and be successful, uh, I, whatever your definition of success is. But, you know, like whether or not that's probable or whether like it, it opens up all sorts of sort of game theory options as far as who can attack whom and what you can threaten and things like that, uh, which which make this very, very difficult to analyze. <laughs> So can you give me uh, just a very quick refresher? Like wh what is segregated witness? Yeah, so segregated witness is, um, it, it is a fix for a bunch of things. It, it uh, fixes the transaction malleability problem, which in turn fixes the quadratic hashing problem. It also uh, allows for a different kind of transaction, uh, which is very useful for something like the Lightning Network. 
uh, we, um, you know, and there's sort of another whole section of the block that that can hold these new types of transactions in addition to the one megabyte uh, block size that has the old type of transactions. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a bunch of things sort of rolled up into one, and you know, it has a lot of different utilities that are associated with it. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the best hardware key security solution on the planet. But Ledger is more than just a hardware wallet. It's your path to eternal bliss and happiness and peacefulness. Do I look like I'm losing sleep? I am, but it's not because I'm worried about my cryptocurrency, my Bitcoin or my Ether. And that's because I use a Ledger. Ledger devices support multiple cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash and more and you can even secure your ERC Ethereum tokens with them or you can add the security support from Ledger to some of the wallets you already love and use like Electrum, Copay, My Ether Wallet and others. All your keys and segregated accounts are derived from one unique seed. Seeds are generated on the device and are never exposed to the host computer. So when you make a transaction, your ledger will present you with the details and kindly ask you for your confirmation before signing. How polite is that? So the best choice right now for anyone looking to invest in security is the Ledger Nano S. It's a keychain sized device that fits in your pocket. It has a screen and buttons and connects to your computer or Android phone using USB. Look, if you're holding crypto and you're storing your keys on your computer, on your phone, or worse, an exchange, you know that's a disaster waiting to happen. Don't be the person that loses their keys because they were careless with them. So don't wait any longer. Secure your Bitcoin, secure your Zcash, secure your Ether. Go to ledgerwallet.com and get your Ledger Nano S today. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. Originally, the idea was to activate segwit with this thing called bit 141 can you run us through what what was bit 141 and why didn't it work well so it bit 141 is actually still going on but bit 141 is based on uh bit 9 and uh bit 9 is a signaling mechanism uh to allow a network upgrade and um and essentially uh any sort of soft work you want to sort of prepare the network and let everybody else upgrade before you actually re let the code go live. Uh, and so you need 95% of the network to signal that they're ready, in, in essence, uh, as part of BIP9 uh, to, to do so. BIP141 used BIP9. I think it's using BIP1 to do that. Um, and, uh, and it started signaling back in November of uh, 2016, uh, so it's been about seven months. And part of BIP 148 or BIP 9 also is that you have a one year expiration so that you don't just keep this bit reserved for that one feature forever. And, uh, and so far it's never really gotten over something like 35% of the network and you need 95% to signal before there's lock in and activation. Um, so uh, some quick technical thing aside, uh, what 95% means is within one difficulty adjustment period, this is 2016 blocks. Typically that's uh, how often Bitcoin uh, adjusts the network hash rate so that, or network difficulty so that uh, you find a block about every 10 minutes. Um, so it, within one network difficulty adjustment period, you need 95% of the blocks to signal for that feature um, and, uh, and you know one nef network difficulty adjustment period is 2016 blocks and I think you need 1916 blocks to signal for it before it locks in and then you have another network adjustment period at, after which it's actually active on the network. Uh, why didn't it work? Well um, it looks like the miners didn't want it <laughs> um, or at least they wanted uh, two megabyte blocks to come with it. And that's, uh, that's essentially why many aren't signaling for it. So that's, that's kind of where we are. I mean, one of the things I always found puzzling about this SegWit thing, and, and also a little bit indicative of just a certain like disconnect with reality of, of, of this 140, bit 141 thing, is this 95% activation threshold. Because I mean, even when that was proposed, there was already so much like division in the community and so much disagreement. And the idea that like, everybody would just like agree and go along and that, you know, even 5% could basically block this. 
it, it just seemed bizarre the idea that this would ever work to me yeah and that that was sort of my assessment as well before it signaled if you look through my twitter feed i was kind of doubting whether or not it would activate ever and actually my pinned tweet from january 1st 2017 is I really didn't think Segwit would actually come online, though, you know, um, that may not be the case anymore. But uh, but yeah, I, I um, like from a game theory perspective, you would have to say this is sort of like a way to expose the other side's position or at least make sure that that's actually what they believe. Um, and uh, and it, it seemed to do that uh, at, at least sort of, uh, you know, force one side to take a stand on uh, on for it or against it. And that's that's essentially what it did. Whether or not that was like a good move is um, I, I can't really say, um, uh, you know, I mean, sort of like who knows what actually works. So, yeah. And how did that, uh, you know, I think, I think the tradition, uh, the transition from that, right, from mm -hmm. the bit 148 and, and, and uh, 141 not going through is, is then this response with this, this idea of a user activated software and bit 148. Can you explain a bit, you know, what is bit 148 and what is a user activated soft fork? Bit nine, uh, I guess, started a while ago, but before that, there was a, it was sort of like, um, hey, we're going to upgrade everything on this date. That was sort of the normal way that Bitcoin was upgraded. And BIP9 was sort of thought to be a lot safer uh, by requiring the 95%. And, and a bunch of other sort of softworks went through before uh, BIP141 based on BIP9, like, uh, you know, check lock time verify and, and, and a bunch of other uh, softworks. Um, BIP 148 or user activated soft fork was sort of an attempt, uh, like after seeing that, hey, no, uh, there aren't going to be enough minor signaling. Um, Shaolin Fry, who, uh, who came on the list uh, and, and for the first time sort of posted to the Bitcoin dev mailing list, uh, proposed that, you know, like since everyone's sort of domain over their no own node, we can sort of band together and reject certain blocks from miners. Uh, and sort of forcefully activate SegWit. And, um, and essentially what it does is it rejects any blocks, BIP-148 in particular, it just rejects blocks that aren't signaling for BIP-141, thus sort of ensuring that on that chain, uh, on the chain that the user activated software will accept, there will be 100% signaling for BIP-141, thus ensuring its activation. Um, but obviously, there there are all sorts of uh, you know things related to that uh, you know uh, sort of side effects of having a soft fork that uh, that result as as a result of you know doing a soft fork, um, and that's that's sort of like the main difficulty of a user activated soft fork is that you're essentially forcing a fork. And can you just explain? user activated seems to be like a, a, a sort of interesting term, right? Because I'm a Bitcoin user, but it doesn't seem like I would have a role in the activation of this. So, so right. can you explain like how, how is that user activated? And it, it still requires right a miner to mine a BIP148 block. Right. Uh, the, the idea behind calling it a, a user activated soft fork is that really a user whoever, whenever you're running a node you're sort of king over your node you can run whatever software you want um, and because of that if enough users band together the thought is that you can bring economic value to whatever to your fork in whatever fashion you want uh, and, you know, you can sort of let the other uh, side go. Um, you do need a miner to actually mine blocks, uh, but it, it's thought it's named such because it's uh, it's driven by the user by running this software um, instead of sort of miners starting to run that software. Um, obviously, it's not all users. It's it's some subset of users that are running it and they can do whatever they want. Um, like I said before, though, the trick to making a soft fork work is bringing enough of the ecosystem with you that you have enough mining power and development uh, going on that it makes sense to sort of uh, 
it, that it's possible to keep going. Uh, and that's that's not entirely clear if you if you just sort of like forked off on your own um, and that, you know, then nobody will pay you anything for your coins on your fork. So let me just rephrase that uh, in, in from so from the user's perspective as, as a user, I want to signal for SegWit uh, and BIP 148. Uh, I, I I install a client that on August 1st will only accept blocks that are signaling for uh, for, seg for segregated witness. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm cutting myself off from the rest of the world, from the rest of the network. Uh, and I'm only seeing miners that are, that are signaling for segregated witness. And so I automatically have 100% uh, mm -hmm. of that 95% threshold. And so therefore segregated witness is automatically activated. On your fork. Yeah. On my fork, right. But that, that, that requires that enough miners uh, are mining these segregated witness signaled blocks for my chain to have any, any value. I mean, if there's one miner uh, out of all the miners that is mining and signaling for, for, what, for bit 148, I'm essentially only getting one miner to secure my chain and that's a problem if that there's not like a specific threshold that is reached i suppose yeah yeah so um yeah it it can be a problem and hash power is going is going to be crucial if uh if this forking scenario comes to pass and this is something that i wrote in one of my articles is uh you, you need a lot of hash power to make this work uh because a uh, user activated soft work, uh, first of all, to trigger, uh, to activate segregated witness, you need to signal by November 15th. And if you do the math between August 1st and November 15th is about 15 weeks. And a difficulty adjustment period is, uh, is 2016 blocks. You need about, uh, you need at least 16 or 17% of the network hashing power to even be able to do one difficulty adjustment period in 15 weeks. So that is uh, sort of the minimum before which you can, you know, talk about the user activated software even being really viable. Otherwise you would do something else after November 15th to get SegWit uh, for your, uh, for your chain. Uh, now, I, I mean, the big sort of plan for a lot of these user activated software supporters is that they would either get miners to mine on their chain because, you know, they see the economic value or they would, um, you know, go buy miners themselves and sort of mine on their own and be competitive with uh, the mining conglomerates in China. Um, yeah, uh, that's a that's an open question, and we don't really know very much about the hashing power that they own or have access to. So, that's a that's a difficult sort of question to answer beforehand. What's also interesting to point out is just the effect of you know different hash rates when you fork, right? Because let's say you have ten percent of the hash, or let's say we say twenty percent, right? A little bit above your threshold. So that still means it's one fifth of the current Bitcoin network hash rate. So that means the block time is going to go up by a factor of five, right? So that means the capacity has, you have lost 80% of the capacity of that network. And all, I mean, uh, the whole problem is, right? Bitcoin's full. So now mm -hmm. you've cut off 80% of the capacity. And at the same time, you know, as a Bitcoin user, I would, in, in that kind of scenario, I would like to be able to move my Bitcoins to an exchange, you know, to potentially sell them, right? So, uh, and, and you you probably wouldn't want to do that on both chains, right? You'd, you'd want to take action uh, mm -hmm. and you want to maybe split the coins as well, right? Because the whole replay attack is another thing. So it seems like you would have, a, you know, maybe lose 80% of the capacity or 70%. Mm -hmm. the, the demand for transaction would, would go up dramatically. So the cost would go up. I mean, I can totally see fifty dollar transaction fees or hundred uh, like very very high transaction fees yeah it seems like in 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 a case where maybe if you have like 45 percent of the 
hashtag they will just be about tolerable but below that i mean this is going to be basically uh, uh like a two week or, or you know a four week or you know six week or something uh complete shutdown of the bitcoin network for almost all its current users yeah and uh and that's yeah there there's so many ways in which it can be screwed up and i i outlined them in my uh uasf scenarios article but basically what you're saying is right. If you have a small amount of hash rate, then everything's going to take longer, not just on your chain, but on the other chain too. It's going to be like a little bit slower. And, uh, and you know, there's a uh, wipeout attacks and uh, I mean, you need both wipeout protection and replay protection on both chains um, because it's, it's possible for both things to happen. Um, wipeout in particular is if the, um, if the miners chain uh, doesn't hard fork, then it's always possible for the user chain to grow longer than the miner chain and wipe out the miner chain. So from an exchange's perspective, you wouldn't accept anything from a miner's chain if the user side has any possibility of overtaking the miner chain. Uh, from the mi uh, and there's also replay attacks, right? Like you can play the same transaction on both chains you may mean to uh, uh, an exchange may mean to only send, you know, ten bitcoins to ten of the user bitcoins to you, uh, but you can replay that protect that um, transaction on the miner side and get ten miner coins at the same time, and that's that's kind of a no go for miners. And this actually happened with Ethereum with uh, when they split is Coinbase was going giving out Ethereum tokens, but people were replaying them on Ethereum Classic and getting Classic tokens as well. And, uh, and that cost Bitcoin, uh, Coinbase uh, quite a bit of money. And uh, so exchanges are going to want both. And in order to do that, you need to permanently split. And this is, uh, this is pretty much what Bitmain said in their press release last week, which was, hey, we're, uh, if there's a user activated soft fork and it looks like it's viable, then we're going to hard fork and we're going to make it so that there's no replay possibility on either chain. And we're also going to add a bunch of these other features. Um, and that, that seems to be uh, a, a good way to solve that issue. But you know, once you get to that point, you have two point Bitcoins forever and you're, you're never gonna merge back to one coin, which kind of How sucks. would one hard fork at this point? Like what, what, what would Bitmain do to hard fork the network? Right, so they they would uh, release a new client, right, new software basically um, that that changes uh, transactions in this very particular way, where uh, you know signatures for one tra uh, transaction don't work for the other uh, for the other chain, uh, and it's it's a sig hash bit that they would set, uh, and that that's actually really clever, and that means that any transaction on one chain would not be valid for the other and they would also require the forking block to have greater than one megabyte uh block size um and uh, essentially they would be at least two mega or have a cap of at least two megabytes going on forever um so it, it would be a very different coin than the than the user coin uh but that that's what they would be doing and and should should this hard fork not happen um, so you, you mentioned Ethereum and, 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 the, and the replay tax that happened there. And mm -hmm. uh, for a while, there was a period there before a certain version uh, of Mist was released where there was a smart contract to which you would send your coins and the smart contract would uh, handle the, repl the replay protection. How, I'm, I'm curious how that works in, in Bitcoin. How do you handle replay protection uh, without smart contracts? Well, so Ethereum is a little different in that it's account based and uh, Bitcoin uses UTXOs. So as long as you can mix in a single UTXO that appears in one and not the other, um, then you can sort of mix that in and all coins from there uh, that's, that have ever mixed with that UTXO would be safe on that chain. Um, there's a very clever um, uh, script that uh that luke jr uh was talking about which would be sort of using n lock time that can also work um there, there are multiple ways um 
you know, at, uh, after about 100 blocks when the first Coinbase transaction uh, that exists on one side but doesn't on the other is uh, mature, then you would definitely be able to, um, you know, transact with anything mixed with that co those coins without any replay um, threat on the other side. So uh, there, there are multiple ways to do it. And if an exchange were smart enough, they can, they can code that. It's just uh, something that they don't necessarily, um, yeah, it, it's, it's not something that they necessarily should be trusted with until they've proven that they can handle it. And the factor, of course, is that this splitting coins, you have to make a transaction, right, to do that. So in, in a way that, that creates all of a sudden, you know, if I'm having these Bitcoins that are like sitting somewhere, well, now I want to split them. Mm -hmm. be, you know, because so, so I can actually transact on the two chains, right? So all of a sudden, that's also going to drive up uh, this demand. And I mean, I know, I know some people actually working on, on, on services, you know, basically for that scenario to just offer like, you know, splitting coin as a service, <laughs> yeah. uh, which, which could, be a, could be a good business in a scenario like that, right? Because there could be a huge demand for uh, to do that. And, and of course, a big advantage if I'm... If I'm able, you know, if I see that, okay, let's say this fork Bitcoin is, is losing some value uh, and I'm able to split that and, and you know, I'm able to, to sell it first, whereas, you know, you, you, you are sort of trying to get in. I mean, there could be that kind of rush scenario and, and I mean, it's, it will be a big advantage, right? When you be able to transact versus people who are not able to transact. Yeah, uh, it might. I mean, as far as the replay protection, like, no exchange, I don't think, is going to accept coins as long as there's replay attack vectors. Um, so I would imagine there would have to be a permanent fork first, like along the lines of what Bitmain has proposed. Um, if, if there's not, then, you know, there's all sorts of risks that an exchange would be taking. Uh, but it, the scenario I think maybe that you're referring to more is sort of like a person to person bet, right? Like, uh, if I think that UASF is going to be better and you think that the miners fork is going to be better, we might just exchange directly. But being able to do that is not so simple in that scenario. Um, but yeah, I, it, it, for an exchange to list a coin, they're, they're going to need a hard fork. And at that point, there's, there's no going back to one coin. It's just two coins forever. And now, of course, so we've, we've talked about that, right, UASF. And, and I think until recently, I was thinking like, oh, this looks quite probable, right? Like this may happen. Uh, but uh, just today, so recording this on, on June 19th, uh, people or miners have really started signaling for this, this new thing, which uh, some people probably know as the New York Agreement. And the other, the other term for it is, you know, Segwit 2X which is basically the idea to do, uh, you know, two, uh, uh, a hard fork to two megabyte blocks and segue at the same time. And, you know, at the moment when I was checking before, there was around 80% of miners in the last, you know, 10 hours or 12 hours have been uh, signaling support for that. So can you just run us through what, what is Segwit2x and how does it fit into this progression? Right, right. So Segwit 2X or the New York Agreement was uh, was something that Barry Silver sort of organized right around Consensus 2017. This was around May 23rd. Uh, he got about 80% of all hashing power along with a bunch of other businesses, exchanges, wallets, etc. that signed on to the agreement saying, hey, we'll do Segwit and two megabyte blocks somehow and we'll, we'll do it. Um, there's a GitHub repository called BTC1, which is, uh, it looks like the lead developer is Jeff Garzik. Uh, that's sort of the client for Segwit2x. And essentially what they've, uh, what, what the agreement said was we're going to signal bit four and it's going to call, uh, and instead of, instead of bit one, which is bit 141, uh, they're going to signal bit four and they instead of 95%, they're going to say, OK, you only need 80%. Now, there isn't a really simple way to do that. And uh, and for the question around the community for a while was, well, how, how are these two things going to you know, be compatible? How are you going to make sure, uh, you know, if you signal for one that the other accepts it and so forth? And uh, and James Hilliard actually came up with uh, with a very clever way to do that. And this is called BIP91. 
and that's that's kind of what got merged into Segwit the te Segwit 2x repository. Uh, I think it was like three days ago. Uh, and essentially, what it does is it's a, it's kind of similar to BIP 148 in the sense that once once uh, BIP 91 is activated, you have to signal for BIP 141 or else you'll get orphaned off the network. But in order to activate BIP 91, you need 80 percent of like 336 blocks, which is like 291 or something like that. Uh, within you know, then 336 blocks is like two and a third days or something like that or uh, 48 plus eight, uh, it's like 56 hours. Within a 56 hour period, you need 80% of the blocks to signal for it. Um, and, that it and then there's another period where it activates so people can get ready. Uh, but essentially what, what it will end up doing is have one chain that's all BIP 141 signaling. Uh, so instead of 95%, again, it'll get 100% because you're forced to signal. Um, and what the miners have done is instead of signaling either bit one or bit four, um, they're right now just sort of putting in the Coinbase transaction uh, NYA as signaling support. Once BTC one, uh, that repository produces a client, then all these miners can run it. And when they start running it, presumably it'll be more than 80%, uh, triggering bit, bit, bit 91 which in turn will force every block to signal for SegWit, at which point SegWit will get activated and presumably that would avoid uh, BIP 148. Um, but, you know, we don't we don't have that much time to do that. We, we have like less than six weeks before August 1st. So uh, this uh, we're going to we're going to cut this close, depending on what the UASF supporters would decide to do. So let's just recap here then. So today on June 19th, miners have started signaling their support but not supporting just just signaling by putting a string in the coinbase transaction that says we support this this new york agreement mm -hmm. and then that is supposed to give us some kind of signal as to how many miners on july 21st uh will actually go live with this and and um and put the extra bit and if enough miners do that then then we have SegWit. Why would we then? Why would anyone at that point uh, want to activate user activated soft fork? Uh, seeing as SegWit would already be activated. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm not entirely certain uh, what would happen, but I, BIP 148, if BIP 141 is locked in or activated, won't do anything. That's part of the code that's in their code base. Uh, but if we're sort of in that in-between state where BIP 91 is locked in, but BIP 141 hasn't been, then it, it's possible anyone running BIP, one, uh, BIP 148 client would fork off the network. Whether or not they're doing that accidentally or purposefully is actually an open question. Uh, but, you know, like it's pre presumably, you know, that's good enough. Like locking in BIP 91 should be good enough for user activated soft fork uh, proponents to just abandon BIP 148. Uh, but it's also possible that it won't. Um, now, I, I would say that's kind of a small possibility, uh, but it is something that they could do if they still wanted to um, and sort of fork off the network, despite the fact that most miners are going to signal for SegWit. Um, it does look like, though, that there's more than 80 percent um, minor support for, you know, at least in the Coinbase transactions, which presumably means that BIP 91 would pass very quickly, which would uh, enable BIP 141 to pass within a two week period. Now, like if, if they can release the client like, um, like July 7th or something like that, then everything would go through without a problem. And, but you know, there, there may be some things that the user activated software people might want before if it doesn't happen before then to sort of abandon their plans. And that's uh, that's kind of an open question at this point. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. 
Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. One of the things I find interesting, sort of what you pointed out here, you know, the, with this user activated software, like a bit 148, one of the things that seems sort of, you know, controversial or questionable to me is this, this aspect of like, you know, splitting off and saying, you know, you don't recognize this other a chain, but then something kind of similar is happening here too, right? Where you say you have to signal for SegWit. So it's kind of a little bit of a strange thing that you're using a similar aggressive strategy against these people who want SegWit to lock in SegWit. Yeah, yeah. So BIP91 and BIP148 use basically the same mechanism, which is you have to signal for SegWit. Uh, the difference is that BIP91 requires 80% of miners to agree first. Uh, so in the case of a soft fork, um, you know, like the soft fork is sort of has tighter rules. So anybody that doesn't signal for SegWit will get orphaned off. And, you know, with 80%, you're, you're not going to be able to build the chain longer than the other one. So there's not that much risk, uh, not not nearly as much risk for BIP91 because you, you already have 80% of the network for you. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it's pretty much the only way people have found to sort of reduce the 95% threshold to 80%. And that's essentially what BIP91 is doing is reducing the threshold significantly. Uh, but it's it's a clever and, and way to do it. Uh, whether or not you agree is sort of up to you. And, you know, whether or not that that changes things for Bitcoin going to the future. Um, yeah, that that's 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 an interesting question as well, whether or not this will set a precedent for other sort of forks as uh, you know, going forward. And what have the what has been the reception to this New York agreement? It's a good question. I, I would say that for the most part, people aren't quite aware of what it means. Uh, I think I think the thing that makes a lot of people nervous is, is this software going to be safe? Is this software going to be useful? Is this software going to get merged back into core? If not, then who's going to take care of it and all this other stuff? Um, so it's it's kind of an open question. Um, and, you know, I, I'm working on an article actually, like even right before this podcast to answer some of those questions. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's not entirely obvious what's going to happen, uh, or you know how how many people know about it. I uh, I, I was on another podcast a few days ago with uh, this guy named John Light, and he was saying, "Why are we so down on this news? You know, like this should be a reason to celebrate. We're 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 unified again and everything else." Um, and you know, he may have a point on that. Well, let's let's put it this: Who is down on this news? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so I, I, you know, I've been spending some time, uh, you know, reading through our Bitcoin and our BTC, and it's very interesting to see the responses there. And, and I mean, I think uh, on on both sides, lots of people are down on this. Lots of people don't like Cedric Two X, and there was an interesting blog, uh, interesting Reddit post, kind of you know, long and thorough. We link to it in the show note by Greg Maxwell. You know, basically saying Segway 2x is terrible. You know, uh, it has all kinds of flaws. You know, it says lack of detail is clearly defined. What's going to happen? Time frame is too short. And and you know, he basically says uh, and that core developers are unanimously against Segway 2x. And and I think it is the case that this New York agreement, you know, okay, it was was has support from all, you know the vast majority of miners. It has support from many of the big. Bitcoin companies, but uh, there was no support there really from you know the the current core developers. So this, what do you think is going to happen with that? Like it, you know, if they are not on board, what kind of response could we see from them? Yeah, the, I mean, the, this is sort of the big open question, and I think the re, I, I think as you're pointing out, the reason for sort of the pessimism around it 
Well, we can agree on SegWit. I think everybody uh, on the core side certainly wants SegWit. There are some others on the other side that are okay with it as long as they're getting two megabyte blocks. And that's what SegWit 2X is. It's SegWit plus two megabyte blocks. Up to the point where there's SegWit, um, I think everything will be okay. But then after SegWit, when the two megabyte block issue comes up, that's where I think the rubber meets the road. We're just sort of delaying this forking point. Uh, there's something called BUIP55. Uh, that's the Bitcoin Unlimited Improvement Protocol uh, or in proposal uh, number 55. And, uh, and that essentially says that there will have larger than one megabyte blocks starting on October 15th or 18th, one of those two. And, uh, and that means that that will fork off the network, right? Like uh, it'll be one side or the other. So we're, we're not necessarily like getting peace. Uh, we're, we're just sort of having a ceasefire for a few months as a result of the New York agreement. And the bigger issue still hasn't been resolved. I, I, this whole like core developers don't support it argument to me just seems kind of absurd. I mean, think, think of any other product, right? Like some, I don't know, take like Magento open source e-commerce software if you have like the majority of the ecosystem uh you know hosting companies and companies using this software saying we want this feature why you know in, in what right mind would the you know developers of that software say no we don't agree with this like that's what your users want that's not what you want and uh, it, it's uh it seems like such an, an uh, unvalid argument well, I, I don't think it's about valid or invalid arguments at this point. It's it's sort of whether or not, uh, you know, one. I mean, there's there's plenty of users on both sides of the aisle uh, that that want a hard fork that don't want a hard fork. Um, the question is, um, you know, what's the end result? I, I, as long as it's not a contentious fork, uh, I think we can do whatever forks we want without too much trouble. Uh, the, the the problem is that this once you have a contentious fork, uh, well then you're going to have two coins. That's just how you know consensus is. If you don't have consensus, then you're going to fork, and that's that's sort of uh, how Bitcoin works. And that's uh, you know it doesn't matter if it's you know just a few people um, or a lot of people, uh, as long as they have enough sort of the ecosystem on their side, then they can fork off. And that's where it looks like, uh, you know, will be. So, so let's go a little bit deeper into this, the, the, the second part of the SegWit 2X, which is the 2X thing. Uh, one of the concerns that I've seen people have on, on RBTC is, you know, that they think it's some sort of ploy, right? So SegWit is going to get activated and then people are going to, you know, pe people are going to back out and, and they're basically going to not try to, you know, refuse to do bigger blocks. So what kind of mechanism will there be after SegWit is activated if this goes through to go to the two megabyte blocks? And, and are there assurances that, you know, uh, both will happen and that it's not only just going to be SegWit gets activated and we won't see the bigger blocks? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as uh, So they were trying to design something that would force a two megabyte block hard fork along with SegWit, except nobody can figure out a way to do that. Um, so what ended up happening is, uh, hey, we'll just do SegWit first and uh, anyone that signed the New York agreement is bound by it, I mean, presumably to support two megabyte, uh, a two megabyte hard fork. Um, a lot of core developers didn't sign that, right? Uh, there's a bunch of companies that didn't sign the New York agreement, so they have no obligations to the New York agreement. And, um, you know, it, and this is sort of where the conflict point just is, uh, is put, for, put out further three months. We, we still don't know what will happen at that point. Um, I mean, it's possible that uh, that uh, the companies that didn't sign uh, the agreement may be able to sort of fork off on their own or obstruct things or make it so that the two megabyte hard fork doesn't come to pass. But, you know, I mean, who knows? It's it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's the next debate that's coming up. And that's that's something that we're going to see a lot of name calling, a lot of a lot of, a lot of accusations, a lot of 
arguments that uh, that's the that's the next thing that's coming so yeah but uh, even even assuming you know the, the companies that have signed the new york agreement is, is it like clearly defined you know is there a clear date when it comes or because because you know presumably they may say well we signed it we are gonna because this is what the core developers have done for a long time right they, they were like Yes, yes, we will hard fork the bigger blocks, just not now, right? Now it's a great and some later point, and then the, of course the challenge has been the other side doesn't believe it. That you know that it's kind of a, a, a deceptive tactic. So is is a similar po thing possible here, or is it really clear what those companies have agra agreed to with the New York Agreement, so that you can say, you know, you've agreed to run or support these two megabyte blocks at that time in this way. Uh, and you know we can hold you to that word. Yeah. So here I'll, I'll read you the the first paragraph of the New York Agreement. We agree to immediately support the following parallel upgrades to the Bitcoin protocol, which will be deployed simultaneously and based on the original SegWit two megabyte proposal. Activate segregated witness at an eighty percent threshold, signaling at bit four. Activate a two megabyte hard fork within six months. So there is sort of a deadline of six months to do something. Um, and, you know, anything after that, I guess, uh, wouldn't be it. But uh, there, there is an obligation, according to that agreement, to at least attempt a hard fork uh, to two megabytes within six months. So what's your assessment? How, uh, this is going to be a tricky question, but uh, <laughs> what kind of probabilities do you assign to different uh, results or do you think that uh, the SegWit 2x is going to go through like that and that the two megabyte blocks will get activated in that time or do you still see a significant risk of a, a division and a hard fork? Well, uh, um, hard so fork, I think... Yeah, I mean, the split. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the August 1st hard fork is uh, significantly reduced in probability, I think, as a result of uh, what's happened recently. Um, a permanent fork sort of later on, say on October 15th to 18th, something like that with BUIP 55, uh, that's still sort of significant, at least in my mind. The biggest risk to sort of an August 1st uh, non-event uh, would be uh, the, you know, SegWit 2X client being ready in time. That is like tested to everyone's satisfaction and running on the miner, uh, uh, at the miners, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it being used by the miners, essentially. Um, I, I think it'll be ready in time, and hopefully it avoids an August 1st day, but, you know, we, we have something even further down the line, and, like, really, nobody's agreed to anything. It's just sort of warring parties having a ceasefire for a few months, and that's uh, now, what will, what will happen after that? It's hard to tell because the current situation hasn't exactly shaken out yet. It's kind of like, you know, at the end of World War II, there were all these like things that were happening and nobody really knew how the map was going to be drawn after the war. Um, yeah, it's kind of like trying to predict that. We don't, we don't know what the map looks like at this point because it's a little... The, this current war isn't over yet, or this current battle isn't over yet, and we have another battle afterwards. So I'm not really comfortable making any predictions, in other words. <laughs> so, so in this, like, metaphorical representation of the Second World War, who's, who's Hitler in this version of it? <laughs> <laughs> No comment. I'm not. I, I'm not gonna make any comparisons to Hitler, despite Godwin's law. Um, yeah. Uh, so, in your opinion, what's what's the greatest risk here? Like, what is the single greatest risk that we might run if things go like catastrophically wrong? Hard fork. Uh, two viable coins and a hard fork. Um, I think that destroys Bitcoin's um, value proposition as a store of value uh, and uh, and that causes a complete price crash uh, which would be terrible um, uh, you know for uh, for obvious reasons uh, that to me is the biggest risk um, yeah I mean I, I'm okay with almost anything that will keep Bitcoin on a single chain um, and and right now I'm not seeing that yet um i mean, for now i think uh we'll, we'll have segwit but you know there's this other issue of a hard fork that's in the new york agreement that 80 percent of you know of people are have agreed to so 
I mean, does that mean that, you know, uh, something bad will happen? Not necessarily, but I, I mean, it's, it's not over yet either. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're still sort of in the middle of this whole drama and we're, we're not going to see resolution for a while still. Yeah, I agree with you. I think if you if you look at you know the viability of Bitcoin, right today, I mean, I think Bitcoin is is not in a great position, right? Because it's it's obvious that the, the usability of Bitcoin and and has greatly suffered uh, in that you know that the just the transaction fees and and the times have have been uh, certainly you know for example for us using Bitcoin as a company, it's it's become much much less attractive. And, you know, you can't really recommend it or show it to people like you could in the past, send them some, you know, all, uh, lots of things that, you know, we used to claim about Bitcoin aren't true anymore, or that you used to have show it Bitcoin, explain the benefits, all of those things fall apart. But at the same time, um, if Bitcoin just stays together, I do agree that there is still a very, very strong case as this digital gold, digital store of value. And, and of course, the ideal would be that you're in, able to increase capacity, uh, at least in my view, both on-chain and have off-chain solution and SegWit, right? All of those things. And I think if those happen, then there's really a chance for Bitcoin to, to grow tremendously. But if it forks and there's two Bitcoins, I'm just thinking about the mainstream media narrative, right? Which has been so, so much, uh, you know, Bitcoin is booming, Bitcoin is coming. And then all of a sudden, there's two Bitcoins now everybody's at war you can't really transact the capacities i mean the, the stories will be would be awful and i think uh, it would be um yeah it, w it could you know i'm sure bitcoin would still continue in some way but i think the the biggest arguments and, and reasons why people were excited about bitcoin would be permanently destroyed yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, immutability is is a huge property that you need for store value. Once you split them, you've broken immutability, and that that I think takes away more value than anything. But uh, I mean, I think you're also right in the sense that you know the Bitcoin will still survive. Uh, it'll be in two different coins. Uh, it's I, I think we've seen through like the recent altcoin pump, like no coin actually really ever dies, right? Like as long as someone's willing to mine it. It will just keep continuing uh, no matter what. Um, and uh, and I, I see that for Bitcoin as well, uh, whether or not it's something that's that useful, uh, you know, once you have set a precedent for a hard fork uh, or a permanent fork into two coins is is a big question in my mind. So, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, sorry to end on such a sour note, but yeah, it's, it does, does seem like uh, there, it's not all good news as a result of the New York agreement. It does seem like there's still more hurdles ahead. Cool. Well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Jimmy, for coming on today. I know uh, perhaps we'll have you on again at some point. I know you also wanted to speak a bit about drive chains, about some other mm -hmm. scalability ideas that might be very uh, exciting. And, and I think this entire debate is going to be with us for a while, right? About the, the conflicts that are going to come out of that, the, the attacks. And I have to say, you know, on some level, of course, it's a bit sad, right? On some level, you, you, your Bitcoin's obviously suffering, right? And Bitcoin's mm -hmm. future is threatened in some way. But on, on another level, it's also just enormously exciting and interesting, like the different scenarios and the different ways this could play out. So in terms of, uh, in terms of tension and what's going to happen, uh, it's, it's rarely been as interesting in Bitcoin as today. Yeah, and don't forget, like we've doubled since the beginning of the year. I mean, we we're uh, from a price standpoint. There's, uh, I mean, we're we're doing fantastic. If you asked anyone a year ago, what would you think about Bitcoin at twenty five hundred dollars? Or uh, I think a lot of people would have said, "I'll take that." You know, doesn't matter what other strife comes with it. Um, and, and, you know, I don't I don't I, I want to end on a more positive note. So, I mean, remember that Bitcoin survived a lot of stuff already. You know, it, it survived the Mt. Gox collapse. It survived many, many different hacks of exchanges. Uh, you know, Bitcoin forked against itself way back when and it still survived. So there, there are many ways in which uh, people have tried to kill Bitcoin and it's always survived. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, I would love to see something like drive chains uh, make scaling a non-issue. Uh, unfortunately, it, it seems to not really have that much community support. Largely, 
due to the fact that not a lot of people know what it is. But and you know, I, I would love to come on your show sometime and 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 talk about uh, you know side chains and a, a way to scale and do a lot of other exciting things with Bitcoin uh, with it. But uh, but you know, for now, I think you know talking about scaling as that's the main issue on people's minds. It, it makes sense to um, you know explore that issue thoroughly. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Jimmy. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And of course, uh, thanks so much for our listener for once again tuning in. So we're going to have links to many of, of the interesting articles Jimmy has written, as well as the New York Agreement, the Bit main article, uh, Greg Maxwell's post, and a few other things that you can check out if you want to go a little bit deeper here. And uh, yeah, if you... We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You find this show and other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And if you want to sh- support the show, you can do so by leaving us an iTunes review that helps new people find this the show. Uh, thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. Bye.